Hey guys, Mr. Klein here, and here we are with our last lesson of the chapter. Uh, it's on Egyptian achievements, and so let's go ahead and get started. Now, we know a lot about the ancient Egyptians. Uh, we know about the pyramids, the great buildings, the long civilization, pharaohs, things like that. And most of what we know about ancient Egypt, along with other ancient civilizations, comes from their writing. And the Egyptians were famous for their writing system, which was one of the first systems of writing, and we call it this system of pictographs, we call it hieroglyphics. Now you might have known this already, but in particular, hieroglyphics was a lot like cuneiform in that each word part uh, had a symbol, and this symbol represented one or more sounds in the Egyptian alphabet, uh, in the Egyptian language rather. So instead of you having cuneiform, and this is the difference between whereas cuneiform, you had multiple pronunciations in one word part, each symbol in hieroglyphics was part of the word. It was usually read vertically, and so we can look at this, hieroglyphics. So each of these w symbols that we see is a sound that you needed to pronounce in order to say it. Now, without any way of translating it, this just looked like really cool art that we figured was language, but we had no na way of translating it. And we found it initially on rocks, because that is stone, because that's where it was originally written, but later on, the Egyptians found a way to write with ink on paper made from reeds called papyrus. Okay, and yes, that is where we get the word paper from. So what they would do is they would use ink and they would use what looked like ink pens and they would write in papyrus. And so for scientists, uh, this was a really great discovery because papyrus doesn't decay or doesn't tear or fall apart. So it survived even to today. But the big problem was understanding what it meant. And for hundreds of years, people would look in Egypt and they would see this stuff and they had no clue what it meant. But in 1799, a great discovery was made. And we found a stone slab with hieroglyphics and their meanings written in Greek. And we call that the Rosetta Stone. Yes, there is a computer program where you can learn about different languages called Rosetta Stone. And it's the same idea. And it was found in 1799. And this is the actual Rosetta Stone. What you have up here is at the top. At the top, you have ancient hieroglyphics. Then you have late Egyptian, which is kind of an alphabet-based thing. And then here at the bottom, talks about uh, it's the Greek translation. And it's word for word. So someone in any of these three languages could read it and understand it. And it was actually a fragment of a sign that looked a lot like this, as we can see right here. And essentially, what it was, it was written around the time of Alexander the Great. So only about 300 years BC. Uh, so about 2,300 years ago, and it was written to show that the new ruler of Egypt uh, was a descendant from the pharaohs, and he was a god too. So for those who spoke Old Egyptian, it was written in hieroglyphics up here. New Egyptian, it was written in the Egyptian alphabet here. And then for those who spoke the Greek, which they were the Greek rulers, it was written down here in Greek, so everyone could understand it. So using the Rosetta Stone, scientists were able to start translating, and suddenly we were able to figure out the language and learn all of this stuff that we know about ancient Egypt from today. Now, ancient Egypt didn't just build pyramids, okay? They built huge temples, and so let's look at some. And so here we are in ancient Egypt. Uh, and so we have major temples, like the most famous one here is in the Luxor Temple. So... The Luxor Temple is right here on the banks of the Nile. And as you can see, it's still here. It's a major museum. Okay. And see, here's the huge columns. And here they are at night. And here's, here's a mosque next to it. But as you can see, it's this huge temple with the Sphinx and things like that all throughout. And so these were monuments to the Egyptian gods. And another one is down the river here in Esna. And these temples were centers of worship. As you can see, here it is sitting in the middle of town. And much the same way, these temples were huge and they were really expensive in order to build. So in many ways, they were like the pyramids that they built in the Old Kingdom. And 
So they were big, huge, extravagant buildings where worship of the Egyptian gods could take place. And the temples, as you saw, had many statues and painted walls. And near these temples, you had two architectural features. Usually you have what was called an obelisk. And an obelisk are four-sided pillars rather that are pointed on top. And here's an obelisk from Luxor that was actually transferred after Napoleon Bonaparte's expedition to Egypt and put in France. So it's on top of a pillar. And as you can see, it's written in hieroglyphics and it's pointed here at the top. So it's this huge column with point at the top. And so you would have these all around the temple. And also you'd have sphinxes, which are huge statues. You saw one earlier with head, the head of a goat, but uh, a body of a lion. But usually you have heads of humans as sphinxes, but the bodies of animals, whether a lion or an eagle or something like that. And of course, when we talk about the sphinx, we also know about the Great Sphinx, which is in Giza. And here's the Great Pyramid of Khufu bit back here. So you can see the body of the lion, uh, the head of the human. And these were considered religious icons. So e uh, Egypt, Egypt built huge temples for their gods. They had all sorts of gods. Cats were worshipped, for instance. Uh, dogs weren't. Uh, and when uh, the pharaoh was killed, he would also, uh, uh, when the pharaoh died, rather, and he was mummified, the cats would be killed and buried along with them because they figured cats would holy and would help you out in the afterlife. So Finally, so we've talked about their language, we've talked about their temples where we saw art and language, I'm sorry, uh, and the art, so let's talk about the art itself. Now, Egyptian artists were masters of their craft. Most of their works were found in temples or tombs, as you saw, but most people couldn't see them because ordinary people couldn't visit them. They were too busy paying taxes and trying to survive in order to do this. Visiting temples was a job for a priest or someone important. Now, Egyptian art had this strange style, if you will, and when you hear someone say, walk like an Egyptian or something like that, we're talking about it because it looks like they're twisting like they're walking. So let's look at this picture from the last lesson with Ramses. As you can see, the way they're looking, they're kind of turned around where their heads would be facing off to the side and stuff. So it allowed you to see the profile of the body, but it did, wasn't very realistic. And... And so that was the art style. In addition, an important thing that we noticed was that the size of the person mattered a lot in the painting, uh, while animals appeared more realistic. So if we look right here, back here, whenever you would have paintings of like uh, a pharaoh, for example, Ramses fighting invaders, as you can see he's huge. He's the most important person. This person, invader being killed right here, is probably like one of the heads of the kingdom and for here his generals and lieutenants and here's the Egyptian soldiers fighting as you can see the smaller they are the less important they are whereas animals tended to be more realistic in the paintings but for examples like this because Ramses is fighting on his chariot the horse would be made just as big also so, but much of what we know about Egyptian art and stuff uh, we see the bits and bobs from the temples but most of Egyptian art and mum mummification practices are best based on what we found in this tomb of King Tutankhamun, who was a pharaoh who died at about the age of 18. And because ancient Egypt lasted for several thousand years and they had all this stuff filled in of gold for, uh, for the king to live in the afterlife, like this burial mask of King Tut right here, raiders would go in and break in and steal the gold and the jewels. But King Tut's tomb was left relatively hidden in the Valley of the Kings and we couldn't find it. And when we found it in 1922, we were amazed at all the amazing stuff that we found in here. Here's this tomb right here with all the paintings and the monkeys uh, and paintings to accompany King Tut in the afterlife. We were just amazed at all the stuff we found, including jewelry like this. Okay, Very high detail, lots of gold and things like that. Uh, much less this amazing mask of King Tut there. And in addition to mummification practices, we found the organs of him, we found him very well preserved and things like that. And so a lot of what we know about mummification and burial practices and art and religion uh, came from King Tut's tomb along with other places. So that concludes our chapter. We talked about three things. We talked about writing, we talked about hieroglyphics, and how we couldn't understand what hieroglyphics were until we discovered a Rosetta Stone which was a copy of hieroglyphics, Old Egyptian and Greek, which allowed us to unlock the language and learn a lot about ancient Egyptian history. 
We talked about their temples, uh, and, and outside of temples we had obelisks, which are tall towers pointed on top, usually with hieroglyphics written on it. Also sphinxes, which were bodies of animals with heads of humans. And then we talked about the art, where the greater the person's importance was, the bigger they were in their paintings. They were usually painted in a sideways style. And most of what we know was from this guy's tomb, King Tut. So that's it for the lesson. And as usual, if you have any questions, please let me know. And thanks for watching.